أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المظلومين واللعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن الناس من يتخذ من دون الله أندادا يحبونهم كحب الله والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله صلوات الله محمد Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2 of the Qur'an, verse 165. We continue with the subject that we have selected for this holy month of Ramadan, which is yearning for Allah or a shawq ila Allah. And in this verse of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, and amongst people there are some who have taken for themselves objects of worship besides God. They love them as they ought to have loved Allah. But as for those who believe, they are intense in their love for Allah. <clears throat> the last time we spoke on this subject, we were looking at the various uh, symptoms that one finds in people who yearn for Allah. And we gave examples and compared them to people who normally are in love with things or people besides Allah on a day-to-day basis and how you will see a similarity between um, obsessions and romantic love with this love with divinity. We gave various examples and we wish to continue from that. Uh, before we move on to the next symptom, um, I just want to share a small passage that I didn't mention the last time. One of the symptoms that we mentioned uh, uh, last uh, week was that um, those who yearn for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they often cry because of their love and we said this is a symptom that you will also see amongst human beings that when they are in love they will cry as an expression of their love and there was a passage I wanted to share with you just so you understand that love speaks a different language of its own that cannot be rationalized when people are in love what moves them and what makes them tick is something very different from people who are not in love. People who have not experienced love, they cannot understand this. Now this passage is actually from a book that teaches Arabic grammar. But I won't get into the details of what uh, parts of the Arabic grammar it is uh, teaching. It suffices to just know that in classic Arabic, Himam can mean death. And Hammam is a bath or a public bath or a sauna. And the story is as follows, that um, uh, there was a man and a woman who were in love with each other, and the woman fell sick, and she was told that she was going to die. So while she was on her deathbed, she found out that the man she loves had gone to the public bath. He had gone for a sauna. So she composed some verses about this experience that while she is dying the one she loves has gone to the sauna to take a bath. In the olden days these public baths were uh, uh, where people would go uh, to, to bath as well as to relax and to you know sit in a room where it would be full of steam and a sauna basically. So these verses are from the woman as she is dying. She says Ya Ashiqi لو كنت عاشكا لما فضحتك عندي محنة الأيام Oh my love, if you are really a lover, there would not the cruelty of fate separate you from me. فوالله ما إن صفت في شرء الهوى أنا في الحمام وأنت في الحمام I swear by Allah, love between us has not been divided with justice. For while I hasten towards death, you hasten towards the bath. 
now, he replies her with a verse. I'm showing you the language of love. That when people are in love, they speak a different language altogether. He is responding to her why he went to the bath. He says, وَلَمْ أَدْخُلُ hammam qasdi tanaimi." I did not go to the bath for the purpose of entertaining or recreating myself. فَكَيْفَ وَنَارُ الْوَجْدِ بَيْنَ الْجَوَانِحِ How could I do so when the fire of love burns within my chest? وَلَكِنَّنِي لَمْ يَكْفِنِي فَيْضُ أَدْمَعِي But indeed I was not satisfied and it was not sufficient for me that only tears should pour from my eyes. دَخَلْتُ لِأَبْكِ مِنْ جَمِيعِ جَوَارِحِ I went to the bath so that I might weep from every pore of my body. So this is his justification for why he went to bath. And the purpose of this is just to show you that when people are in love, whether they are in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they are in love with an object or with a person, Sometimes their actions don't make sense to you and me. When we look at it, it looks like it's madness. But they do it for a reason that the mind cannot understand, only the heart can understand. And it's very easy to judge someone just by their actions without knowing what's in their heart. So that was just as an example. Moving on then on our subject, one of the symptoms that you will see between people who are in love and people who yearn for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that people who are in love they love to shower compliments on the person they love they love to uh, speak words of adoration they love to uh, um, compose poetry, send cards, write letters, speak to them and they constantly shower them with compliments not because they want something in return but that is a way in which they express their love in the very same way, if a person truly yearns for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find that very often they are not silent. They are constantly in tasbih, they are constantly doing dhikr, they are constantly engaged in praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not do this because they want to go to Jannah or because they want to amass their thawab. They do this because they are in love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At every opportunity they will do sajda. They do not wait to do sajda when it's time for salat. They do not do sajda of shukr only at the end of salat because that's a habit and it's convenient. When you finish, you do one last sajda, then you stand up. Sometimes you do things for a habit, you forget why you're doing it. Huh? Like some people think when you read this dua, ilahi azmal bala, it's so that people can stand up. So the purpose of the dua is to make people stand up. Sahih. So some people also, sajda of shukr is something you do in the end and then you stand up. But what is it you are doing when you put your forehead and do shukr? When you fall in love with Allah, you will not need an excuse to do such thing. You will find that before you go to bed at night, you will want to sneak and go to a corner and do one more such thing before you go to bed. When you wake up in the morning, you will find before you preoccupy yourself with anything, you will want to go and do one such thing and thank Allah. You have given me one more day to worship you and to show you how much I love uh, uh, being your, your slave. There was a person who was a slave of Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says the fourth Imam used to do sajda so often and so frequently on every blessing that sometimes he would do it in public, in the marketplace. And he says, I used to get embarrassed because he was with me and he was prostrating in public. But this was the fourth Imam. If you try to rationalize this, you might say this is wrong. You know, what are you trying to say now that we should start doing sajda in the parking lot? You're trying to rationalize. What I'm trying to say to you is this is the language of love. So I want to just talk a little bit about this idea of dhikr and this idea of uh, constantly communicating with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dhikr is the only act of worship for which the Imams alayhi salam have clearly said there is no limit. There is nothing like excessive. For every other act, 
there are limits. There are certain things after which the Imam might say, it is better if you don't exceed. For example, fasting is highly recommended, other than the days on which it is haram, if you can fast around the year, fast. But you are not supposed to fast day and night. So at night you break your fast. <coughs> Praying is mustahab, uh, when it's uh, other than the wajib salat. But after the sun rises, you are supposed to go out and earn your living. But the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, one, is that one ibadah for which the imams have clearly said, there is nothing like too much. Do it so much that people may think this is excessive, but it will still not be excessive. One of the reasons why the Ahlul Bayt salam used to do istighfar to Allah, even though they had no sins of their own, was precisely because of this, that, O oh Allah, we seek forgiveness from you, that we have not remembered you as you deserve to be remembered. And when in fact there was no one who remembered them the way they remembered Allah. They are the initiators of dhikr of Allah. It is from them that the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala learns how to do tasbih. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to create any creation, the first thing He created was the nur of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. From that nur He split and created the nur of Ali, and from that He created the nur of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa and from their light He created everything, including the angels. When the angels came into existence, they knew that they were created and that we have a Lord who created us. But they were dumbfounded. They did not know what to say. So they are there. They exist. They know there is a creator. But what should I say? They did not know how to articulate. Imam al-Sadiq says, We taught the angels how to glorify Allah. Kabbarna fakabbaru al-malaika. سَبَّحْنَا فَسَبَّحُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ We did takbir, then the angels imitated us and they did takbir. We did tasbih and they imitated us and did tasbih. And then they, the imams themselves, are doing istighfar and saying, Oh Allah, we have not remembered you as you deserve to be remembered. We have not done justice to you. So dhikr is one thing when a person begins to yearn for Allah, they will do it when they are awake, they'll do it on the bus, they'll do it while going to work, they'll do it while they are working. Somebody once said to me, it's impossible, how can I concentrate on my work while I'm doing dhikr of Allah? It is not impossible, it is very possible. But there are ways and methods and a gradual progress before one attains to such uh, levels. So examples, just to show you from the yearning of the Prophet himself and yearning of Amir al how they loved remembering Allah and praying to him constantly, the Messenger of Allah, peace be on him and his family, he used to say that the apple of my eyes is prayers. Salat is the apple of my eyes. He used to say, Kurratu aini fi salat. We pray and then we get exhausted, we relax. We finish praying, then we say, now I can rest. We finish praying. The Messenger of Allah, when he was exhausted, he would want to pray. Because praying was his way of relaxing. He used to say, Qum ya Bilal, fa'arihna bis salat. Stand up, O Bilal, and give adhan. And give us the pleasure of praying. Put us at rest and give us the peace and the tranquility of praying. And this is something that I mentioned and I hinted at as well in, a previous, uh, in one of the previous nights of, of uh, this Ramadan that the Ahlul Bayt salam, they were doing us a favor by disengaging themselves from this constant remembrance of Allah and taking the time to preach to us and guide us. Even though people thought that we were doing them a favor by obeying them and listening to them. And I, I actually have a hadith, uh, I'm not sure if I'm carrying it with me. Uh, yes, I have a hadith here actually to prove this point. This hadith is from Al-Kafi, Shaykh Al-Kulayni narrates this from Kitab Al-Hujjah concerning the fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad Al-Baqir, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says, there was a time when the fifth Imam, alayhi salam, was taken from 
Medina to Damascus to the court of the Caliph Hisham bin Abdul Malik. He says when Abu Ja'far was taken to Asham to the court of Hisham bin Abdul Malik, when he arrived at the door, he was first asked to wait outside. Then the Caliph Hisham said to his people and those who were present from the Banu Umayyah, he said, when Muhammad bin Ali walks in, I will start insulting him. And when I have finished saying to him whatever I want to say, and you see me become quiet, then I want each one of you, one after the other, to start rebuking him and insulting him. He wanted to basically humiliate the fifth imam. Once he had planned this, he ordered the fifth imam to be allowed to enter into his presence. When Abu Jafar salam entered, he made a gesture first with his hands, as if saying to everybody, Salamun alaykum, like he did salam to the general public. He offered them a general greeting, then he went and he sat down. This annoyed the caliph even more, because first of all, he did not greet him individually as the caliph. And then he sat down without asking his permission. So Hisham began to insult Abu Ja'far salam. And amongst the things that he said to him was he said, O Muhammad bin Ali, why is it that one or another from your family is always causing disunity amongst the Muslims and calling people to follow them, thinking that he is the Imam because of his ignorance and foolishness? He says this to the fifth Imam. And he continued insulting him as much as he wanted. When he became quiet, others, one after another, began to insult Abu Ja'far salam until they all finished. When they all finished and became quiet, he alayhi salam stood up. Then he addressed the people and he said to them, now listen to what he says to them. He says, O oh people, what is it that you want from us? And where is it that you are going without us? Through us, Allah guided the first of you. And through us, He will finish guiding the last of you. If you have temporary power and dominion, then to us belongs the future sovereignty. Uh, sovereignty. And, and there will be no dominion after our dominion, because we are the final people of Allah, as Allah says in the Quran, and the end belongs to those who guard against evil. Then he rose and he left. So what is he actually saying to the people? He is saying, you are blaming us of causing this unity and causing you grief. It is not we who want you. It is you who need us. Where will you go without us? We have been appointed as guides over you. And there are such examples in history that will clearly show that it is people who went to the imams, they called them, and then they turned away because they couldn't bear the justice or the piety of that imam. But the imams in themselves did not want to preoccupy themselves with people, other than the fact that it was the wish of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have examples from Imam Ali alayhi salam himself, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. We are told that when he would stand up to worship, he would begin trembling. And people would say to him, Ya Ali, why do you tremble in this manner? He would say that when Allah created human beings and when He created the mountains and the earth, He offered all the creation this as a trust. Who will take this trust and become my representative on this earth? Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal-ard wal-jibal fa'abayna an yahmilnaha wa hamalaha al-insan. Insan was the one who said, I will take this amana, I will take this trust. I will take this responsibility of being your representative. And so Imam Ali salam says, I am trembling because I don't know the time for fulfilling this amana has now come. The time of salat. And I don't know if I can fulfill this amana or this trust. He says, Imam Ali salam says, he says, from the day the messenger of Allah said to me, O oh Ali, salatul layl is a nur. Namaz al-Shab is a light, it is a nur. I have never missed Salatul Layl, ever. And somebody once said to him, Ya Ali, what about the night of Harir? What is the night of Harir? During the battle of Siffin, the Muslims 
from the sides of Imam Ali alayhi salam would fight with the Muslims on the side of Muawiyah during the daytime. Once the sun would set, the two parties would separate. The next day the battle would resume. There was one night during a full moon night when it was bright and the battle continued raging throughout the night. And the number of losses on both sides was unmatched on that particular night. So that night went down in history as being a very famous event and it's known as Laylatul Harir. When throughout the night people fought. And this person is asking Imam Ali, Oh Ali, you did not miss Salatul Layl even on the night of Harir. He says, yes, even on the night of Harir I did not miss Salatul Layl. That is how important it was to our Imams to be in constant communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would like to uh, uh, come towards a conclusion with just um, one or two other hadith, keeping in mind that we have just completed uh, uh, commemorating the wafat of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. This hadith is from one of the people who loved Imam Ali alayhi salam by the name of Dirar. Dirar says, Dirar bin Dhamra al-Kinani, he says, I entered into the court of Muawiyah after the passing away of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam when Muawiyah had already taken power and control. Muawiyah said to me, Sifli Aliyan, describe for me Ali. This is the enemy of Ali asking one of the companions of Ali. Describe for me, tell me what kind of a man Ali was. Dharar says, I tried to excuse myself and I said to him, I would prefer it if you don't impose this on me. But he insisted and said, you must describe Ali to me. And so Dharar begins to describe Amir al-Mu'mineen. And in that passion of wanting to describe his Imam, he pulls his sword out. He roots it into the ground. He holds on to it firmly for support. Now he is describing his Mawla. He says, فَأَشْهَدُ بِاللَّهِ لَكَدْ رَأَيْتُهُ فِي بَعْضِ مَوَاقِفِهِ وَكَدْ أَرْخَ اللَّيْلُ سُدُولَهُ وَغَارَةِ النُّجُومُهُ I swear by Allah, I have seen Ali one night when the night had become dark and the stars had scattered all over and he was standing in his mihrab يَمِيلُ فِي مِحْرَابِهِ قَابِذًا عَلَى لِحْيَتِهِ يَتَمَلْمَلُ تَمَلْمَلُ السَّلِيمُ he is standing in his mihrab, holding on to his beard, swaying from one side to the other, crying as if he has been bitten by a snake. This is who is describing Amir al-Mu'mineen. وَيَبْكِي بُكَى الْحَزِينَ And he was crying like a man who has been bereaved. فَكَأَنِّي أَسْمَعَهُ الْعَانِ وَهُوَ يَقُولُ O Muawiyah, it is as if I can hear Ali right now in my ears. I can hear him saying. What is he saying? Ya Rabbana, Ya Rabbana, Ya Rabbana, and he went on calling out to his Lord. Then he turned to the world and he began saying to the world, Ilayya tagharrarti wa ilayya tashawwafti. O world, are you trying to deceive me? Are you waiting for Ali? Hayhat, hayhat, ghurri ghayri. Never, never will you deceive Ali. Be gone, he tells the world. فَإِنِّي قَدْ تَلَّقْتُقِي ثَلَاثَ لَا رَجْعَ بَعْدَهَا أَبَدًا I have divorced you three times after which there is no return. This is a play on words because in the Arabic language the word dunya is feminine. And when a man divorces a woman three times he cannot take her back. So Amir al-Mu'mineen is playing on those words and saying to dunya, which is a feminine word, I have divorced you three times after which you cannot return to Ali. فَعُمُرُكَ قَسِيرٌ وَمَجْلِسُكَ حَقِيرٌ وَخَطَرُكَ يَسِيرٌ Your life is short, your association is short-lived, and your hazards are plenty. Then he goes on to say, I heard Amir al-Mu'mineen saying, آه آه مِنْ قِلَّةِ الزَّادِ Alas, alas, how little are the provisions of Ali. وَبُعْدُ السَّفَرِ And how far is the journey yet? وَوَحْشَةُ الطَّرِيقِ and how frightening is the road ahead. وَوَحْشَةُ الطَّرِيقِ وَبُعْدِ السَّفَرِ وَعَذِيمِ الْمَوْرِدِ And how important is this goal? And he says, as he began describing Amir al-Mu'mineen in these words, Muawiyah began crying. He says, Muawiyah was wiping his tears with the sleeves of his shirt. 
And then Muawiyah began saying, now this is the enemy, the arch enemy of Ali saying, he says, Kada kana Abu hasan Indeed, indeed, this was what Abu hasan was. He is admitting, who was Abu hasan He says, indeed, this was Abu hasan Then he says to Dirar, tell me, O oh Dirar, kaifa wajduka alayhi ya Dirar? How do you feel having lost Ali? How does it feel to lose Ali? Tell me. And Dirar says, By Allah, I feel the pain of a woman whose only child has been slaughtered in her own laps while she cries incessantly and her sorrow knows no end. Then he stood up and he left. So, this is the Imam himself. Now, one again might argue, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm coming to a conclusion, but there is one more hadith I must also narrate to you, because one might argue that this kind of narration is only for Ali. That it is acceptable for Amir al-Mu'mineen to have been yearning for Allah and to have devoted himself to the worship of Allah in this manner. But what about his Shias? What was Ali's expectation from his Shia? And the objection will keep coming up that we are not supposed to become like this. But the question will still remain, why did Ali keep saying this then? So let me give you the example and then conclude for tonight, insha'Allah. The first example is from a companion called Sa'asa bin Suhan al-Abadi. This is in Kitab al-Irshad of Shaykh al-Mufid. He says, one day Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam prayed the Fajr prayers. When he finished the final salam in the prayer, he turned towards Qibla as he began mentioning Allah. He did not turn to the right, nor did he turn to the left, until the sun's shadow had reached the height of a spear on the wall of Masjid of Kufa. That means Ali prayed Fajr. When he finished Fajr, his Fajr prayers, he sat there quietly. He didn't look to the right, he didn't look to the left. Quiet, until the sun rose. He was just praying and remembering Allah. Once the sun rose, he turned his head towards us. Then he said, I knew upright men in the time of my companion Rasulullah, who used to spend this night alternating between sajda and ruku, and in the morning they would have disheveled hair, they would be dusty, and between their eyes there would be a lump like the knee of a goat as a result of their sujood. When they remembered death, they quivered like trees quivering in the wind, and their eyes would shed tears until their clothes became wet. He says, I knew men like this during the time of Rasulullah. Then Sa'asa said, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam stood up, and he was speaking as if the people were heedless of his words, and he walked away. This is one example. The final example, there was a full moon night when Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam left the mosque and went out towards the cemetery. The cemetery was outside the, uh, the city limits. So he goes out to the outside of Kufa towards the cemetery. A group of men began following him from behind. He realized there were people walking behind him. He stopped. He turned and said, Who are you? They said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, we are your Shia. He looked at them closely at their face. Then he said to them, Why don't I see on you the mark of my Shia? They said, What is the mark of your Shia, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen? He said, they have yellow faces through staying awake at night. They have bleary eyes through weeping. They have hunched backs through standing in prayer. They have hollow stomachs through fasting. They have dry lips through praying. And there is the dust of those who show humility on them. This is another example. So, this is a famous tradition, and there are so many like these I can pull out from you. Sheikh Saduq in his Sifat al-Shia, in his Fadail al-Shia, in his Al-Mawa'id. You will find all kinds of traditions from the 6th Imam, from the 5th Imam, from Amir al-Mu'mineen. A very high expectation from their Shias. I will just conclude by reiterating the point I made a couple of nights ago. If these qualities are rationalized, they will not make sense. If a person decides, I'm going to go home and I'll stop sleeping now and I'll stop eating and I'll stop doing this, one could object and say this is wrong. But if one follows a different approach and learns to yearn for Allah, then these qualities will manifest themselves naturally to the person's capacity. 
And in the coming nights, insha'Allah, we will be talking about how one begins to yearn for Allah. So, there were people who could do this, and there will be people in all days and ages who will do this. But they will do this after falling in love with Allah, and after yearning for Him. And these will become the natural side effects that will manifest in their lives. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami'ul alim. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our gathering here this night. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to give us death until we have realized our full potential. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us the shias that the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam wanted. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give shifa to those who are sick and maghfirah to those who have passed away and to hasten the appearance of our Imam. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami'ul alim. Salawat ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam.